my name is Debbie Hopkins. I'm here with the Queen Anne's County Department of Emergency Services, and we are really pushing our Queen Anne's County Goes Purple campaign. Uh, as part of that, we are taking some time to touch on uh, different topics for this month. And with us at the Department of Emergency Services, we are really talking about opioid orphans and um, some different substance abuse things, such as Narcan administration. We partnered with our Queen Anne's County Department of Health. Um, and today we're going to talk about recovery. We're going to talk about the fact that this is something that you can go into recovery and lead a successful life and be happy. Um, there are ways to get help. And so today I'm super excited that Kirby has agreed to sit and talk with me um, about her story. So Kirby, thank you. I appreciate you being here. Um, I know this is uh, super personal, so I cannot thank you enough for being willing to share your time and your story with us today. You're welcome. So, um, Kirby, let's just start with some simplistics. <clears throat> How old are you? I'm 27 years old. 27, and you are in recovery now, right? Yes, I have three years and some months clean. Three years and some months clean is a super phenomenal achievement. So I cannot congratulate you enough because I know that every day that that can be a struggle that you face and will probably be a struggle all of your life. Mm -hmm. um, so I thank you for, for facing each day and making a choice to stay clean. That's a big deal. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to know if you would be comfortable sharing a little bit about your story and maybe um, take us back to how old you were maybe when you started and how that kind of evolved. Okay. Um, so when I was younger, um, I was into sports. I had a really good childhood, was always going on vacations. And then when I hit middle school, I started going through like a, a phase of not caring or listening. Um, I was always getting in trouble. And I smoked marijuana for the first time in middle school. And um, when I got to high school, I was playing basketball on the high school team. Um, and then I just, it went downhill from there. Um, I drank a lot in high school and smoked marijuana. I didn't do opioids until I turned 17. It was after I graduated. I turned 17 years old. I tried opioids with a family member. Um, and then after that, it was every single day. Um, I didn't think it was possible to get off of it. I was doing anything and everything to get the next high. Mm -hmm. um, I had two kids in active addiction. I had social services involved with my oldest son who's now five years old, he, they put me in the Suboxone program. Mm -hmm. That obviously didn't work. And they told me I needed to go to rehab. So I did, and at the time I just did it for them so they could mm -hmm. get off my back. Um, I got out and I used again. And then I got pregnant with my second son. Um, I had him after that, I was in a drug raid and I realized, like, I needed to get help. My kids don't have me. Uh, I chose drugs over them. I loved them dearly, but I, I love drugs more. So I went to rehab. And when I was in there, at first, I wanted to just go to make it look good in court. But I was listening to other people's stories Given, I, I was given suggestions and different resources to go to a recovery house, and that's what I chose. Um, I went to a recovery house in Easton called the Rad House. I stayed there for three months, and then I went to court for my sentencing, and they sentenced me to jail. I only did 90 days. After that, I came out, and... I was like, well, I have clean time, so I don't need to go to a recovery house. I ended up trying heroin for my first time, and I overdosed. Mm -hmm. um, after that, I realized, like, this, I need to go to a recovery house. I can't do this alone. So I go to a recovery house in Chestertown called the Mission House. Um, 
stayed there about two months and I relapsed again, but this time it was with alcohol. And I ran for a week straight, turned my phone off, didn't talk to anybody. And then the house owner called me and told me that she saw potential in me and she knew that I could do it. And I decided like, this is my rock bottom. I can't, I can't keep messing up. My kids need me. So I went back to the recovery house and I've been clean ever since. Um, I stayed for a year and then I moved out and got my kids back. And then I moved to another house. I ended up getting pregnant with my third child, my daughter. It sounds like you have had definitely a rough time and um, and you've had some children during that time. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that I know that you stated very early in your story was that you came from a complete home, um, you know, an intact family. You had pretty much, it sounds like, a pretty good childhood, sports and vacations and different things. And I think that that's important to note because I feel like um, a lot of times people relate addiction to this, you know, these broken homes and, and bad childhoods. And um, I think it, it is important to know that you had a pretty normal, I guess what people mm -hmm. would say is normal or expected childhood. Um, so it gives us a moment to drive home that addiction is non-discriminatory. Doesn't matter what your race is, what your um, religion is, your sexual orientation, what your background is, this can happen to anybody, right? Yes. Um, so we, we definitely want to drive that home. The other thing that I heard you say um, is that your first drug that you tried was marijuana. Mm -hmm. And um, I know from, you know, just some education that I've had, they've said marijuana is this gateway drug. Um, and when did you say that you started marijuana? Was it middle school, you said? Yeah, the first time was in eighth grade. Can you tell us a little bit about, um, because it's, I think it's important for our general community to know, how easy was it for you to get the alcohol and the marijuana while you were in middle school and even going into high school? Um, it was pretty easy because I knew a lot of older people. Mm -hmm. And at that time, like, a lot of my friends were already smoking weed. Right. Um, and the alcohol, we would just take it from our parents. Mm -hmm. So I think it, it begs for us to reiterate the fact that our parents in the community, our guardians, really need to lock up their alcohol. They really need to lock up their prescription medications. Would you agree with yes. that? Mm -hmm. um, so I know you said you had now three children. Yes. Um, and it sounds like you definitely um, have fought to get your children back. And I applaud the fact that you were able to recognize something that you said that hits home for a lot of folks is that, um, you know, I love drugs more. And and I know that you deeply love your children. Yes. Um, and it's that drive of that addiction that just drives you to pick that drug up or that drink. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't disregard the fact that you love your kids, right? Right. So <clears throat> we talk about opioid orphans um, from an emergency medical services standpoint because we're in folks' home and, um, you know, there's oftentimes that we do find, unfortunately, folks that have overdosed and we have to give this Narcan um, and treat these parents. And sometimes the outcome is not what we hope for. Um, and we leave children behind. Um, I am super proud of you. Uh, I just you. met you, but I'm super proud of you because your kids now have a mom in their life uh -huh. that's present. Um, so I think that that's phenomenal. Um, is there any message that you would like to give to maybe someone that's going through what you were going through. What is what is something you would share with them? Um, maybe how they can get help or how, what was that rock bottom like and, and what advice would you give somebody right now? Okay, so the rock bottom was I lost completely everything. No family, no, like my kids gone, no job, no car, nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and that's when I realized, like, I don't want to live my life this way anymore. Um, my advice would be to go receive help from somewhere. You can come to the Queen Anne's County Department of Health and ask for a peer support specialist, and we can give you resources 
and help you get into rehab, therapy, um, recovery houses. One of the things that I learned in my education, um, and you may have to help me with this because I'm sure you you know it off the top of your head, was um, folks that are suffering from addiction really truly just have like three outcomes, right? And it's like recovery, jail, jail death, or death. Or, yeah. So um, we are hoping that the folks in our community, we we are providing these the support with Narcan in our community. We are providing the support um, from the Department of Health. You and your team are phenomenal at what you do. Uh, I see that as we're doing the, um, we previously discussed that we have, if, so, if we give somebody Narcan from an overdose that we transport them, mm -hmm. they don't get to really refuse that. And I've mentioned it in a previous segment that you guys will meet us at the hospital to be there with that patient as they may be at rock bottom. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's a phenomenal thing that this county is doing and it's a great partnership between the Department of Emergency Services and the Department of Health and the Sheriff's Department and um, the you know state police and Centerville police. And so um, I want to thank you for sitting down with me. It is super phenomenal that you are able to share um, and I encourage anyone that is um, contemplating recovery to reach out to the Department of Health, reach out to our peer specialist team, um, and you can visit our web pages for more information. You can go to Queen Anne's County Goes Purple if you are a family member um, and you're seeking advice or you need some assistance. Um, if you need Narcan, where can someone go to get it? Uh, you can go to the, your local health department and get that Narcan and get that training. So thank you for being here with me. I appreciate it. And thank you to everyone who's watching.